How's it going? Welcome to another episode of the Black Superheroes Matter podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Christian, and today we have Joel Maxim Jr. joining us on the podcast. He's straight from Chicago, Illinois, and he's a illustrator, an art director, a curator, a sculptor, a boxer. You know, he does a lot of stuff, and his projects range from uh, environmentally conscious stuff to economic disparities and gender equality, and really questioning the traditions such as religion and ignorance. And so he has a project called Crave, and he also has a comic series called Hood Comics. It was a great conversation, and I'm excited to share his story with you, and I hope you enjoy it. I wanted to take a break from the episode to let you know that we have some merch that is available. Over at Iltopia Studios, you can find the Black Superheroes Matter art book, which is a collection of illustrations that reimagine your favorite superheroes through the eyes of children of color. We also have a bunch of sticker packs, over 120 different sticker designs of your favorite superheroes. More importantly, we have our Color Me Super coloring book series. Definitely check out the merch at shop.iltopia.com or blacksuperheroesmatter.com. And now back to the episode. So uh, welcome to the Black Superheroes Matter podcast. Again, my name is Stephen Christian. I'm here with Joel Maxim Jr. And, sure. uh, you know, you, I think you're out in Chicago right now? Are you out? Yes, I am, actually. Nice, yeah. nice. You know, we're, uh, I'm in Portland getting over this 115 degree heat. It is, it is madness right now. It is I'm madness right now. Salute you for having a shirt on. Yeah. Portland's yeah, a home of Image Comics, isn't it? Yep, yep. Uh, well, yeah, they're home of Image Comics. Uh, they're mainly known for a uh, Dark Horse. So Dark Horse is like twenty minutes, like twenty minutes down the road. What's with so, you guys? Uh, like Nike, Adidas, Image, Dark Horse. <laughs> like and Armor, Under Armour, and uh, I think wow. there's like Intel, uh, Autodesk is out here. Um, you guys must be giving businesses like good reason to be out there. It's it's a uh, it's it's cheaper, and there's enough going on and it's smaller and so like it, it's it really gives you that like small city vibes but uh but there's industry in here and so uh and so it's like yeah there's just a lot of industry in here so like how like tons of marvel you know tons of marvel dc writers like matt fraction brian michael bendis is out here um they, David studios Walker is out out there? Here. they just live here and oh wow they just work from home. I mean, it's just that's just what it is. True. Like yeah. it, it's just it's just different. It is different, and so it is. I'm definitely going to miss it when I move. But uh, but uh, you know, because of COVID, everything is remote at this point. So I'm just always True. keeping in contact with every everybody. But uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, uh, out in out in Chi Town, you know, like uh, how just how's everything been uh with you? You know, with COVID and uh things opening back up and you know, trying to navigate this madness that uh, that the whole past year and a half has been? I'll be really upfront. Um, I think I have three answers for it. Uh, COVID kind of, um, I can't lie. I'm, it, it completely re It was invigorating. Uh, it, it gave me time to think and, uh, and really get my whole uh, game plan together unfortunately <laughs> and uh and, and um i'd finished writing uh this story uh i was i was finishing my my story arc from the main universe and uh kid you not <clears throat> oh here's a quick peek. nice which is, uh, look at that it's coming it's coming out but um it's coming together it, it is that that my brother colored that for me but um it's not a bad job he'd never colored before but um <laughs> uh I changed, uh, so the second cool thing COVID did for me is I changed the last story, which I haven't drawn yet, out of like uh, 11 volumes, perhaps, volume 11 now. Um, all my heroes are fighting to, to stop this virus. Mm -hmm. And um, they fail, and that's gonna be the last page. Oh, and, um, <laughs> it really it really inspired me, like COVID really inspired me, like, oh, we gotta do them. Like, cause I was just watching a couple of really bad movies, Fast and Furious stuff and some other stuff. And at the end of the movie, like they stopped the virus with the bomb at the last minute. And I'm like, well, this virus didn't get stopped. <laughs> so like, yeah, I got to make a comic book where that's it. At the end, everyone fails. The virus gets out and it's just like, yeah, 
we're all gonna die. Um, and that's and I was like, this is a great way to end the series. And um, so I was like very grateful to COVID for giving me that idea because I hadn't really finished it, the the ending part. And um, uh, you know, the the rest of it's been a a a. a, a I mean, I don't think we've had it as bad as Minneapolis, but uh, it's been really uh, depressing here. The, the police situation in Chicago gets worse every year. And, yeah. and uh, as everyone hears, we have so many cover-ups. So like people are so jaded in Chicago. Um, you just assume the worst. Like you just assume gangbanger shot someone today. You just assume the cops shot someone today. And it, and it makes it easier because then when you hear about it five days later, it's not a shock. But um. I also based this universe in Chicago, FYI. My whole comic book series are all based in Chicago. So um, I, it's a love-hate relationship, you know? Uh -huh. uh, I, but, uh, but from a lot of, it, it's strange. 50% of the city wants to get out. The other 50 wants to re rehabilitate the city. And uh, I, I go back and forth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, interestingly enough, um, one of the, uh, one of the medical schools I got into was the University of Chicago or University of Illinois Chicago uh, yeah, School it's... of Medicine and so uh, and so it was down to either going to Reno or Chicago and my little cousin is going to be going to, to medical school there uh, I mean yeah in a couple of months and so I, sure. I was going to be joining her, joining her uh, and I where's she from of, though uh, she's from well she we all grew up in California in like the Bay oh. Area but like our family is like from there and so oh. uh and so like her side of the family is or like her side of the family is uh um you know like they have like a couple houses there and you know like cousins and and all that stuff there for family reunions it's uh you know it's you know it's, if, if you have resources like a third home. if you have resources in the city it's i gotta tell you if you have resources here it's it's probably the most fun place in the world. And I'm yeah. only saying that because I used to work for the airlines and I've traveled mm -hmm. and my brother is kind of like, I, I know this is getting recorded. I'm kind of nervous. Uh, I don't want to say anything wrong. He's not an A-lister, but he's not unpopular. You know, you know, he, he's, he, he got, he got some plugs. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's been around and uh, he's traveled a lot, done a lot of tours, directed a lot. And, and uh, he and his friends, who are from Chicago, it's like, they can never wait to get back here. So it's like, yeah. you were just in like Quebec, you were just in Tibet, you were just in Paris, you were just in London, you were just in Tokyo. And, and yeah. they all say, yeah, Chicago just couldn't wait to get back here for this party. It's shocking to me. And it's like, we, we spend yeah. so much time trying to get out and then we're like, yeah, but all the culture and fun free stuff is here. But at the same time, like if you've been living in California for a while, for over five years, this cold is, is like, it, it get, it's not for the, the faint of it heart. Is, <laughs> it's, it's, it's some, it's some nonsense. That's all I know. Like, uh, in Portland, I'll say like this calendar year, Portland is definitely sort of like tested in me in, in many ways, just because we had like, you know, the fires last fall. And so that was nonsense. Right. Uh, yeah. we tend to have like a snow apocalypse and like the whole city will shut down for like a <laughs> week. Um, Right now we're going through this like record heat wave, heat which is insane. which is nonsense. Um, and I used to live in Hawaii, so I, I sort of was used to that like you know tropical in the middle of the Pacific sort of craziness that that will come. Uh, yeah, the snow is uh, the snow is the snow is something else. You know, that snow is that snow is something else. So it, yeah, it's only nice to look at when it's falling. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, it, it's, after. It, like coming from Hawaii where like I had to go outside like it was always a great day and it was always hot um I do appreciate like not having to go outside or having an excuse to, to stay inside uh, I think as an artist I really appreciate it because I feel like things could slow down I could be creative like things stop so I could actually like do the things that I love um opposed to oh yeah let's go on a hike let's do this it's like you can't really be creative when you're sort of out in nature like bugs and stuff be hitting you and you know like dirt and everything it, it's just uh, uh i'm just not that type of artist where you know uh where nature sort of 
improves my creative process. It, it just doesn't work for me. And I think it's just because I'm a city kid and, you right. know, like, I don't know. <laughs> like, for example, um, well, let's get back to art. Like, uh, <clears throat> first of all, like, I only have, like, moments where I have money in my life, like every five or six, seven years where I can actually do stuff like other people. So like, yeah. you know, um, all through grade school, high school, like the, the, the idea of me having like $30 spending money, like I, that term was hilarious to me as like, I'm from Haiti. Like, like <laughs> if, if, if we have more than $50, like 10, 10 of those dollars is going back to Haiti. Like people don't understand. You, you, it's really difficult to be Haitian and rich, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but like the idea of me being like 10 years old and asking one of my parents for something for me to paint or draw on, like, it's in, hey. insane. So, so, so like um, the, the motivation uh, is, is really different. Uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting to it. So like all through high school, I, uh, I didn't draw or paint. I didn't even take art classes, but I ended up being president of the art club. When I got to college, I still had to, and, and the, it was a big, uh, it was a big honor. Um, our art club president prior, one before me was the famous world renowned, the Astor Gates. And, and, um, and uh, I got that art club to a level where it was being featured on uh, papers out there, out West. And um, I was, I got the art club on the cover of the Tribune sometimes and um, mm. national acclaim, you know, never took an art class, you know, <laughs> and uh, my father taught me everything I know. And, and uh, furthermore, um, I, I could never afford campus that, that like, I sold comic books to get lunch money or, or, or to get bus fare. You know, like I had the foresight. I was speculating already. Like, I'm going to grab two of these Spider-Man. That way I don't have to walk home like the, the next couple days of the week because I spent, you know, my bus fare going to the comic book store. So basically we started walking to the comic book store everywhere. One of the best reasons I ever got a dog, which allowed me to walk past gangbangers and get to the comic book store slowly in Chicago. But more importantly, furthermore, it's making art. It was ridiculous. I, there was no way I could afford a canvas. I didn't even and that was not going to happen in college so i automatically diverted to found objects not even a question so um, most of my art was was found object art from from the beginning and, and, and uh it, it kind of changed uh the whole concept of of me making art and, um, until i could afford to buy paper and notebooks and and, and canvas and then um that that affected uh the way i thought up of uh my whole motif for creation, everything became kind of like more practical and more logistical and functional based of, of like, why am I doing this? Um, what's what's the end goal? How many people can it affect or help? And and more serious things of that nature. And, and it was really just based on like uh, the whole concept of, of like pur purchasing to to sell. And, and uh, like I, I've never really been that kind of creator. So furthermore, I get into Hyde Park, Chicago. I, I used to live in Wicker Park, I'm back here, but uh, Wicker Park was like the arts hub, but really mm. I, I, I started off working in a plethora of bars in Chicago. That was my reputation. Um, it's so crazy. I'll make this short because I started off a fighter and a boxer. And so some people started asking me to be a door guy at a bar. So I'm like, okay, so I'm working security and um, Sooner or later, I worked in seven different bars in Chicago. This happened in all seven or six, six. Um, I worked security in the door for a couple months. Then the owners or managers noticed, I know every artist that walks in the bar and every DJ <laughs> <laughs> and every musician. And then they're like, how do you know all these people? And it's like, I am an artist and a musician. And they're like, I thought you were a fighter. Well, yeah. And then, yes. um, yeah, it's like I can do you know, more than one thing. Not a monolith here. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, well, you think you can get us a DJ for this night? Like, yeah, sure. It'll be packed. And then, then I'll have to be like, hey, you know what? <clears throat> can I throw some paintings on the wall? What? You, you want to put your art on the wall? It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll make a night of it. And it'll be packed. And um, I end up doing that. Uh, and so, like, uh, that I be become mostly the art director to all these bars. I used to be a door guy. And I usually end up hiring a new door guy. And, and um, 
and, and it's usually a, a pattern that repeats itself, but more importantly, so I moved to Hyde Park because it, it wasn't, Wicker Park was getting gentrified. So I moved to Hyde Park and two different groups of black artists, um, really nice people. Uh, but I always thought this was kind of elitist. They're like, hey, for a couple hundred dollars, we're gonna go away to a weekend and um, go to like a forest preserve or some place and draw and, <laughs> and paint and be creatives. And, and like, I wasn't like offended. This is the end of, of that, this, this short story. It's like, this isn't the type of person I am. All my art comes from being inspired from found object in the city. And it's about yeah. like social, if you've seen it, it's about social justice and equality. Uh -huh. All my comic books are about social justice um, and, and, and like, or people or, or what's around us. Like if I went to the forest, first of all, there's nothing for me to make art with. And secondly, <laughs> what am I going to make art about? Trees like you literally, rocks. literally just taking the source, you know, of inspiration yeah. away. And you're just paying, I'm just paying you guys to hang out with you guys in the forest. <laughs> and you're not that cool. Like, and like all these artists hate me now because I keep saying I'm not going to this thing. And, and, and like they don't book me for any shows. I'm, I'm ostracized. And, and I keep hearing it from different artists. Like, you need to get to the forest and be in nature and relax. And, and like I, these people don't understand. Like I lit literally do not look at the weather i go look at ants like if i want to tell what time it is my mom and i we look at the sky i don't take out my phone if if, if i want to know if it's going to rain i go taste the air outside like i should but that's all i need to do like if i want to know how the weather's going to be for the next week i look at my plants or the weeds growing i i'm so in touch with nature so that when these artists are like we need to get out to nature to go clear our minds to paint i'm just like it's all around you like like i'm paying so much meticulous attention to rodentia and crustaceans and insect life to, to the point like where i swear like is this a new species of birds like encroaching in my neighborhood like and, and people have the audacity to say to me you need to get in touch with nature it's like dude i can tell you how many cicadas i saw today like I can tell you where they are. I can tell you how to find them. Like, like I can tell you every species of ant we're looking at. And you're telling me I need to get more in touch with nature to improve my art, which is vastly better than yours. Like, uh, well, now this is the part where I get a little, a little too much, you know, a little wound up. The nature, but, hey, the nature boy comes out. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm a very competitive person. That's another thing with that group of people. A, a lot of people in Chicago. Huh? I love all music i grew up mm -hmm. playing violin then i oh, switched wow. to piano my father made me play violin so, classically for, trained i'm classically trained i i played violin over 10 years and piano and then um i couldn't get guitar because i'm not it was too difficult but um i can play other instruments vibraphones and um, viola bass but um more importantly um i i started singing in a classical choir at a catholic school for hmm. approximately eight years. We barely sang in English, you know? It's always a uh, German, Latin, sometimes, I don't know what, like, it was weird. Some of it would be Yiddish, but it wasn't, at, it was Catholic music, but it'd be written by a Jewish composer once in a while. So like, I remember one song we sang a lot was Yiddish, um, mostly Latin and German. So, um, and, and then, I, you know, I grew up listening to Haitian music and Dominican music like and and so and uh and then i got really into rapping and uh of course you rap but but uh <laughs> i mean just, but, you know when in yeah. rome <laughs> right so it's like yeah I, I i rap i rap pretty well um and people in chicago are so open to rappers being um aggressive and competitive um mm -hmm. and and I also box, so that, that's also in my nature. But the moment, like, I bring in that aggression, like, to from from rap or or boxing, to to painting or in drawing, it's appalling to most people. And to me, it's yeah. just it's all the same art form to me. And I'm I'm critical of of everyone and everything. My father and a lot of early art dealers. I was privy enough to be around were very critical of me. Um, I've been turned down for shows in very harsh ways that, um, you know, I didn't sit down and cry. 
I, well, maybe I cried a little bit, but uh, I also spent the next 364 days on my craft and went back to these people and submitted my portfolio again. And, uh, and half the time, you know, they're like, oh, we're definitely giving you a show. And half the time they're like, you're still not good enough. And okay, I'm going to go get better. And so like, yeah. you can't seem to do this in Chicago with, with artists, with a lot of artists. First of all, they keep calling rappers artists, which drives me nuts. And, and um, <laughs> we, we need to make a dis differentiation or distinction. And so like, first of all, if you're going to call us all artists, then I'm going to come at these, these sloppy hack painters and illustrators the same way I come at these sloppy rappers, the same way I'm knocking out these sloppy boxers. But the art world in Chicago can't take it. They, they just want everyone to just be happy and they give people certain accolades for, for nothing. Like, uh, and I'll, I'll end it with, with this little hate thing here. Like, uh, <laughs> like uh, in Chicago, when, when you get here, if, please come in the summer if you do. But, uh, oh yeah, I mean, but, definitely not come in the winter. Like do it, not. It's, uh, Waste it, time. <laughs> yeah, typically I'm out there in like August. Like I typically well, get like I'm out there in like August. September. And I should be asking. Maybe you've noticed like the bean, the baseball bat, uh, the cow, Marilyn Monroe. Like all the statue work is basically grotesque and grandiose. Like it's basically yeah. just giant, giant um, extrapolations in size. And mm -hmm. and um and it doesn't matter if the concept is strong or the art is really really um, intriguing. Like what really gets Chicagoans is size and grandeur and then yeah. they want they, they want tourists to come and see like a 500 foot tall baseball bat and to me <laughs> like a 50 foot version of it is just as poignant in, in the right setting but okay 500 foot tall baseball bat in, in downtown great like uh, 70 foot uh, tall Marilyn Monroe oh okay like you know a life-size or slightly larger statue is fine but Chicago's obsessed with these giant statues and, and, and it's not usually impressive work. So it really bothers me. But then I'm not known as a sculptor, although I do sculpt. So I, I don't complain about it as much. But yeah. then when we get to the illustrators who are being propelled to this high level, a lot of them are just, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but a, a lot of them um, simply just copy or, or they just make a Japanese character brown or they make a, a popular <laughs> derivative, you know? The derivatives yeah. is what I should say. Um, I'm not like the most popular illustrators and street and graphic novel faux comic book artists that don't really have stories, but they take, they, they, they make derivatives of popular, you know, comic characters and, and they really don't even read the books. They just find an image they like and they make a derivative of it. And yeah. they start doing that in their street art. And that becomes the poignancy of it, that it's a derivative and it's just plastered everywhere or painted everywhere. And um, like art dealers in Chicago go crazy over it. They love it. The, the, like the, I call it the black Bart Simpson um, um, phenomenon. Like, oh wow, it's yeah. Bart Simpson, but he's black. Or a black Santa Claus, I need this. And, and, it, and it's like. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the, it's like that hype beast culture where it's yes. just like, you know, slap, slap Supreme on something and like, it'll sell millions of copies. Oh, <laughs> like, you know what? Like, thank you for saying that. And, and um. And we're actually friends now. I'm, I'm just sorry about you, but uh, we're, we're more like online acquaintances. We used to be real life acquaintances. And the person I'm speaking of, I will name his name, is Shepard Ferry. He can handle it. He's a millionaire. I don't, you know, the Obey guy. And, yeah. and it's just like, when I, I met him in Chicago, a block away from here, literally, like this is Chicago Avenue. We're on Iowa. It's a block away from here at one of the most popular hip hop bars back then, the Lava Lounge. I met the Obey guy, Shepard Ferry, he used to hang out here. And um, he, this whole Obey thing, you can ask him. I mean, he's not, he'll admit it now. It was a joke. First yeah. of all, it was supposed to be Roddy Roddy Piper. If you, if anyone's ever seen the movie, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. they live. Like, and he's like, well, why don't I just change the wrestlers and make it a joke? As if it was a mistake. Like, I got the wrestlers wrong. But, you know, it's such a cult film. He assumed a lot of cool people had seen it. But most of the people that got into it, obey have no idea who andre the giant is it's so crazy yeah it's, it's so a, crazy it's it's a different it was a different time <laughs> yeah it's, yeah it's... and he's definitely to me the epitome of the hype hype beast culture he just slaps obey on something and um and it, and it, it sells now um i'm happy for him he was he you know he's technically a very sound artist and 
he, he wasn't the most popular guy. And it's it's nice to see the, the little guy and the underdog make it, like make it yeah. big. Um, he was never noticed. He got bullied, unfortunately. And, um, you know, uh, there was just, there's just dumb codes and, and street rules with these guys. And they, they used to pick on him. And um, the only reason they didn't pick on me is because I was popular and, and, you know, I had a little bit of history as a yeah. martial artist. So um, I, I don't wish any harm to him. I'm, I'm just... I'm just acknowledging that un unless you play that uh, hype beast pop popularity game in, in the art scene in Chicago, you really don't get anywhere. The poignant guys, the poignant artists kind of all go under the radar. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I think that that is often across the board. We're starting to see a little bit of the democratization, but like still it's kind of just a new variation of the same old stuff, just more platforms. You know, more platforms means more variation of more variation of that of that that same problem, and and so you know people, I think people sort of find their niche or find their find their you know their community or a little you know spot where they'll thrive, and then you know they'll they'll just do their things, and so uh, you know it's a uh, you know it could be worse. You know, people would just everybody just ran around just like stealing and robbing everybody <laughs> right <laughs> there's a lot of that but not it could be much worse and, and, yeah. and you know what I, I shouldn't just say hack artists um I, I gotta make a distinction there's one of these guys the most famous guy from chicago and i'm, I'm going to not say his name um because i just i just saw him he was moderately polite and i just saw a post of his where he was being polite but um <clears throat> although like it's like how i don't know how someone with, with such average talent is a multi-millionaire but um <laughs> but it's like hey he got the marketing right he got but uh first of all um he's got a derivative of a very popular japanese character and you might figure out what i'm talking about he's also he's also combined and merged a character with cannonball from um, the M new mutants we all know yeah. what i'm talking about so um but his art actually that's that's like his pop art um he's been trying to push his fine art which is um illustration and um, and he does it in st stipuletto style, and uh, and it's brilliant. And he does Afro retroism. When Afro futurism was all the rage, he did Afro retroism, and I love that. And um, his his anatomically correct sound, like the vantage points, conceptually blow like against the grain, yet super progressive. And let me put it to you this way: he could sell an eight by he could sell a, a painting of a character that's a combination of two it's a derived it's derived from two other characters it's an amalgamation i should say and um it it, it has no poignancy it, it has no social merit um and yet like his afro retroism work um he he'll he'll have that at a a show at the University of Chicago. I saw it at the first one at the incubator. The first time I saw it, he was selling it for forty dollars. No one bought it, and then I saw it at, at a, and this was a, a serious gallery, a, a critically acclaimed gallery. And uh, then I saw it at a boutique, which was a, a, a owned by that gal. I mean, affiliated with the gallery, but it's still a boutique down the street, yeah. and with wall space. A couple months later, I saw it again. And I'm like, first of all, how is this not sold? And I got to admit, I had no cash on me. I wish I'd just run home and, and grab my, my, dip my wallet. It was so close to my house. Um, he, he'd lowered the price. And in, in, on the, and, and showing in, in, in like contrast, his pop art goes for probably a million dollars a piece hmm. while his fine art which is a thousand times better to me he can't sell it for thirty dollars <laughs> he, he priced it for thirty two dollars no one bought it and it was at a fundraiser for like kids <laughs> in africa and, and I, look at, like, did, no look at they didn't even want it for the kids <laughs> So I'm like, okay, this is why he's doing this crap art and making yeah. millions. Nike has signed him. Adidas is drooling over him. You, you know, he's got movies coming out and it's garbage. And, and um, 
So to keep up with his pop art, he bites and copies a lot of other artists and, and, and incorporates his character. And so, you know how these Chicago guys do. And um, yeah. he, Chicagoans love it. The art, nobody in the art scene appreciates him. Everybody hates him. But a lot of people in the art scene aren't aware of his serious work either. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. So, like sometimes you got to play the game to just pay the bills. Right. And then, you know, exactly. I think the like the the one thing that I've learned from COVID, right, because uh, since COVID, like I was, you know, animator, comic book illustrator, right? Like I was sort of that combo. And then when like before COVID hit, I started getting into like immer the immersive space. And so like the tech art scene, you know, AR, VR um you know like game design all those different things and so uh the very the the minimal amount of work that i would put into like my ar work you know and showcasing that that changed the game for me to where okay i could do these little things you know work on these little projects and stuff get paid for it and now i'm sitting here in the summertime not stressing out about bills and i get focused on the things that i really care about and so it's a uh, you know, it's, you know, so sometimes, you know, you got to sort of find your niche, find what works, you know, I think the, I think the, you know, as an artist, you're always either like going, going from project to project, because ain't nobody going to hire nobody full time, right? right. Like, or, uh, or you find, you find your sort of your niche that, that will bring in the money to, you know, right. lower your, lower your stress, right? right. And, uh, and allow you just take a step back and actually like control your destiny and like control sort of your art practice. And so uh, I'm getting a taste of that now. It sucks that like, it's gonna all stop in like August cause I got to start school. But like, I have a greater appreciation for uh, being able to find something that works so that I could, so that I could fund the things that I really care about. Um, and yeah, it's tough though, you know, because you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to, uh, you kind of have to take that like initial driving force of like your pride, be like, oh yeah, I'm going to do this all original. I'm going to do this. And it, it's going to be all like my brainchild. And I produce this all on my own. And, uh, and sometimes you kind of have to just take a step back and, and just be like, Hey, you know, like this opportunity is in front of me. And, you know, if I don't take it, somebody else will. And then, right. and then, and then I'm gonna have no sales and I'm, gonna, and I'm still right. gonna be penny pension. And so it's tough, like it, it's really tough. Like It is, I, I just opened an art gallery and um, it was it was really for that reason. Cause I was like, well, yeah. if, if I don't open this here in this space, someone else is going to do it wrong. Yeah. And, um, and it's not costing me very much. Thank goodness someone else is yeah. like paying the, the cost up front. But I was just like, I can just keep selling other people's art to, and, mm -hmm. and support myself. And, and like like I said, um, well maybe I can show you something. Um, like, uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, my first uh, finished project. Besides hoodie, what you might already be familiar with. So there's hoodie one through five on Amazon. But like as you've seen, that's very character stylized. Like yeah. almost my my answer to manga because I actually read the manga handbook as a child and it scarred me. <laughs> Like, I was like, you don't like black people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That there's some uh, there's some problematic things. Uh, yeah, there's some problematic things. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to look past. Yeah, um, my my uncle Gabriel, rest in peace. You know, a, a lot of my uh, I'm not I'm not here to bang and I'm a manga right now. I, I do that enough. But a lot of my family, you know how it is. Like you like comic books here's the manga and it's like oh thanks and it's like it, it's yeah you know it's like you know i like i like thought-provoking movies and then you'll tell me to watch a soap opera it's like hmm, yeah and, and it's like okay I'm, I'm not i'm not gonna knock it but yeah so ho hoodie is kind of my my answer to manga because my uncle gave me the manga handbook which i'm going to quote a couple of things from it because i don't think anybody talks about this enough one of the quotes in the manga handbook before i burned it i literally burned it um was a uh, protagonists are slender and tall with straight hair and antagonists are usually dark and short with curly hair, small eyes and big teeth and, and round noses. These are, this is a quote basically describing black people. 
And um, the whole book is like that. Um, and it tells you, you know, like, protagonists stand straight and are never in dark clothing unless it's a suit, stuff like that. It's ridiculous. And, and, and um, it's like, it's the opposite of what Marvel and DC would say, even though, you know, they're not the bastion of, of equality either. But um, yeah. uh, it was like in your face with a manga, like, hey, you know, um, if they don't look European, uh, they're a joke or a sidekick or the villain. And um, yeah. so like I put hoodie out, but what really infuriated me was like, when people would be like, oh, this is cool. I thought it was gonna be like, you know, Marvel or DC. And it's like, oh, I really do love Marvel, DC. And like, you I know, just needed I to put that out first. But, um, but then uh, it just, it gets really upsetting for me. Like, oh, you can't draw for real, for real, right? And, and it's like, oh, buddy, like, you have no idea. You have yeah, like no it's- idea. Uh... I, like it's i think the i think the the openness to uh to put out a story whether it be hyper stylized or, or super realistic i think that you know the the art an artist putting out work is hard enough right you know and so you know if you're working on a hundred page book you know by page 54 you're going to be feeling like huh I, I don't know if I want to do this right now, but I still got to finish it, right? Like, right. And so it, it's a, just to even get to the point where you can even go to print is a, is, a, is a feat in and of itself. And so for those that are like critical of it, for me, it's like, you, you never put out, your, like when you put out your first book, let me know. And, and, and then we could, and, and we could share Apple, you know, we could compare apples to apples. But until then, it's like, you either going to pay me my, you know, pay that right. $15 for a copy or you, or you not, you know, right. You can, you can right. write a review after you pay that. You can buy the book and write a review. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, and, and I'm out here like, yo, it's free on Kindle. <laughs> Go critique yeah. me. But, um, so this is the next project. This is uh, a little oh, under. Yep. Um, yep. That that's, so, that's stack right there. So like, mm -hmm. uh, like you're saying, like, uh, it's all mostly all scanned and I'm, I'm literally, uh, ready to print but i need print money and that's where yeah. like literally where i am with uh, these two projects and um i, I don't even think, realize people don't realize how close i am but um this is a really like as you can see like this is a really strong project um i've, I've got oh let me show you i just connected my phone but, <laughs> yeah so i've got uh hundreds and hundreds of pages you know oh, yeah of, like uh so I, I have, I don't know what I hit, but I have multiple projects going and um, that's my shortest one. <laughs> my, my other <laughs> project called Friction, which is also 99% um, inked and colored. 99% uh, okay. um, inked, maybe 90% colored. Uh, and, and I haven't scanned that, but the project you just saw is literally scanned and ready to print. <laughs> like I, yeah. I want to add, I, I literally just want to add some jewelry to a couple characters, but it's finished. Like the text, editing, everything. It's been done for years. Literally saving money to print. It's, as you can see, you, you, you know, like $79. Is, it, it sounds cheap, but it's not really that cheap. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not. It's not cheap. No, $79 a book. No, <laughs> like 79 Wait, pages. Um, oh, 79 no, pages. I was, about, I was about to say $79 a book to print i was like whoa <laughs> but but technically like when i want to print the samples that's how much it'll cost yeah yeah because it's just you know color pages you know that that page count you'll probably want it to be uh you know like a, a hard bound you know right. like a uh you know yeah like it's those until unless you're printing like thousands of copies overseas right. you know like that's how you know that that's sort of the that's the unfortunate thing right um, precisely so the next book is like 785 pages the one that's like 90 percent finished and so like of course i can't even think about releasing that at once so we're going to break that down to like 26 page like um increments okay okay and then just the release price. it and just release right. it uh incrementally and i think that works like honestly consistency right like you know you you know you work on pages right like consistency like that is the hardest thing to do 
you know, and so not only being consistent with creating, but then being consistent with, with sharing and putting things out. And so if you go through a campaign where you're releasing once every two weeks or once a month and, and you got it all done and you're just releasing it as that, it's like you, I mean, that's, that's why people care about, I mean, one piece is cool, but like, that's why people are like, oh yeah, one piece. Cause they hit a thousand, you know, <laughs> like they hit a thousand. You can't like that, that markets itself right there. Right. Like it, it's a, it's a, you know, I think the, you know, it's one thing to sort of be determined and want to tell the story. It's another thing to be consistent in your practice, because I firmly believe that like, you know, the reason I've been successful as an artist isn't necessarily because of like my art, or whatever. I think it's because I'm consistent enough to where it feels like it's a conversation with anybody that follows me where right. they're keeping up with it and they're investing in it and they're more invested and they'll share their, with their friends and they see the growth. And, um, and I've, I've just grown, you know, to just appreciate that a lot more. I, I concur. I have, I've only been consistent with the, the hoodie, the manga style. This, as you can see, I haven't really gotten it done. I haven't focused enough. I haven't been consistent with the financial funds to get it out there. But, um, but I, I will say that, like, uh, there's a lot of really great artists and painters who actually paint better than I do. And um, they have no marketing skills. And so no one knows they even exist. Like, yeah. they've, they've never had one show and they're my age. And it's like, you're in your mid 40s. You've never had an art show. You're much better than I am. And they're, and they're just still going at it, painting. And yep. it's like, at some point, you need to get out and market yourself. And, and um. And speaking of what you're saying, a consistency, it's like, yeah, like uh, I managed one of the worst three reggae DJs in Chicago. People all say he's the worst reggae DJ in Chicago. What, but, because um, they were actually bad or they're just bad to work with? A little bit of both. Um, he, he's not the best person to work with. I went to grade school with him. Uh, but uh, he's, he's, uh, he wasn't the best technically sound DJ. But most consistent, that was his yeah. thing. I'm going to be mm -hmm. on time. I'm never going to miss a night. Everything's going to sound the same every week. <laughs> like every week, you're not getting any creative new mixes. Like it's the same mix every week. But you know what? For 10 years, nobody misses a night because they know what they're getting. And yeah. they, mm -hmm. they, they know. And that, and that matters. That like, yeah. that is, that is what matters because you could have the complete opposite. You could have like a Lauren Hill situation where you're going to get some good stuff but there's a big <laughs> asterisk there <laughs> like you, you just don't know it's, how long um, do i have to wait <laughs> yeah, you know like yeah. i know it's gonna be i know it's gonna be fire but huh, i i need to i need you know i got kids i need to take them to school tomorrow it's a school night you know like it, yeah. it's and and it's a you know it's tough it's tough and i and i think you know if you don't have the resources or if you don't have the guidance or you're sort of like you know shooting by the hip as most sort of black creatives are doing right because of lack of access to things like it, it it can be difficult but um but i think you know like connecting with people and just being open and and wanting to learn just like really wanting to learn like how things are done uh so that that's what i've grown to appreciate a lot more i uh, was fortunate um to be in chicago is just blessing in itself despite oh yeah crime, the weather it's like you know because you, you got you got access to the culture without having to exactly. you know exactly. like you like it, it's and that's difficult you know yeah and it's like before youtube really was youtube um like man i don't know if you're familiar with c2e2 uh the yeah uh, mm -hmm. yep. yeah I'm familiar with that and wizard world those panels are the equivalent of a really good six week you know workshop you, yeah. you go, you go sit through, like I would go for a weekend and um, I got pretty much jaded by, on the floor. And sometimes I just go <laughs> and I'm in panels for like eight hours. And, oh, and, and it's like, oh, yeah. you can learn so much, like from um, a variation of things. And, and I pick and choose, for example, I'm so blessed. There was a C2E2 um, in Chicago and uh, there were multiple panels going on at different times. I was interested in all of them. It's just like so much overwhelming information and then you can go back online and study there was one panel that did an hour on every color breaking it down like 
from its root, its its uh, its scientific merit, uh, its ph philosophical uh, um, connections, uh, um, e every kind of emotion that's been recorded uh, in psychological tests to this color with humans. Um, what animals in nature have this color? What what uh, plants and foliage carry this color? So uh, like the panels and like to educate artists at like it's unfathomable like all the yeah. information you can get and so like for six years like i decided like i i learned how to make comic books going to these panels unfortunately i'd already started this huge project and when i got to panels they're like you should really start like with small increments and be consistent <laughs> but but now i know but hey and, you know it's it's i think that just speaks to the just the the desire that you had to just explore this and so you know i play around with that where i have i'm on like page 400 of my series but i've only released 200 pages of it and so it's like what do i do with that other three you know you know page 300 to you know 200 to 400 right there it's like well i'll um i may update it with some of the stuff that i'm at with right now but i'll put it out and then i'll just keep moving on because you know i want to get to page a thousand and and so in order to do that you kind of just have to to do all the rest of the stuff and so uh yeah yeah it, it's a i think that you know conventions when conventions open up those are going to be uh you know the things i'm excited to do but we'll see how it goes because i'll be in medical school so it, it's it's going to be tough but uh yeah yeah you know like i i like really appreciate um yeah just really appreciate sort of just the insights and just like how you look at things, you know, how you are sort of not beholden to an institution to find a, a path of education, right? Like, you know, it's sort of the world around you. And I think that like, when you get that education, like you ultimately fall back on, okay, it's the world around you that you're ultimately learning from. And you just are able to look through it and appreciate it through that lens. Uh, and it, it's, a, uh, you know, it, it, it is what it is sometimes. Uh, yeah, it just is what it is because if, if your stuff is good, your stuff is good. And then and then the problem is you just gotta figure out how to show other people so that they could see how good it is too. Indubitably. And uh, and, uh, and that's just a that's the whole skill set in and of itself, right? Like it, it's with uh, with every artist we know, there's always somebody that knew the other stuff that would get it to the to the larger platform. It rarely has ever been Quite just so. the artist doing it right quite like, so and so uh and, and i think it's very much like this too where you know because we have instagram and all these things and you're sort of seeing these accounts blow up you think that it's just them and it's like it's not like it might it might be them drawing but right. like there's somebody else like there it there there is somebody else and uh yeah. and uh, and i think that really speaks to you know the i guess the the paradigm shift that we we think of like where we need to be autonomous and we have to have complete agency and it's like that's not how the world works you know you can't you can't go to the store and just completely do everything yourself you gotta collaborate with people and you gotta you gotta trade and you have to do all these things so that we all live together um, with your art you have to have an audience <laughs> right like yeah. you know <laughs> speaking of so, which I, I'm uh, probably going to start releasing um, on Tezos. And, I mean, I mean uh, NFTs. Uh, Ken, you yeah. going on uh, on uh, Henico? Yeah, I, I I released this image that you saw already. Um, I didn't get on. I'm going on Henico, but I put this on Ghost Ghost uh, OpenSea or Ghost Market, maybe. Both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um and the, oh and the logo, uh, and this logo is on there also. Nice. Uh, nice. Like uh, yeah, this guy. Okay. Yeah. But uh, so th those are the only two pieces I have up. I, I kind of was rushing it. Um, I really shouldn't have jumped the gun like that. I, I think I would have put my fine art on on OpenSea and Ghost Market, and I, I want to bring all the comics to to Hunnicut and use yeah. Tezo. I th I think that's a good market. Um, yeah, it, it's yeah to, i've i'll i'll be just i'll be just following how it, how it goes because i know a couple of people that are uh that are in that space right now um and that are doing some pretty cool things and so uh but yeah yeah you know it, it's a uh, gotta 
you know, it's just been a, it's been a good time just like chatting with you and, and being able to learn a little bit about the process, you know, learn a little bit more about Chicago and, and what that scene is like. And, uh, and yeah, you know, where could, where could people find you? Oh, good question. Um, my music's pushing my music. Every platform, but, uh, uh, nobody goes to my Patreon, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Amazon has my five books, hoodie one through five are definitely on Amazon and Kindle. And I'm really hope people will pick that up. Uh, it's a really strong story. Um, if you like, if you like hip hop or manga or skateboarding or ninjas, it's definitely for you. I'm Crave Chicago on um, Instagram. Um, best yeah. way to find me on Facebook is Crave Art. Oh, and um, my new page. Oh yeah, on Instagram, I have a new page. Forget about Crave Chicago. Forget about that. My new page is a uh, Hood Comics um, on a uh, Instagram. Go to Hood Comics on Instagram. Forget about okay. Crave Chicago. That's a cacophony of chaos. Uh, hood Hood <laughs> Comics ain't, ain't too bad too. But uh, yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so we'll, a- we'll definitely we'll definitely put that stuff in the. Uh, we'll put all the the stuff about the books and everything and. Um, you know, in the descriptions and, and we'll try to do awesome. some, some stuff to promote it as well. Awesome. Yeah. We're, um, I'm working on events and parties, uh, smaller versions of C2E2. I, I want to do, uh, there's, there's one or two, there's like pocket con and, and there, and there's, a uh, some other cons that are based towards POC, but, um, I, I uh, there pocket con is mostly for children. And the, the other con is, is called Wakanda con. And I think that in itself is derivative. I'm not about to just go yeah. take some of these stuff. So like I, I'm working on my own con. Uh, I, I have a name for it. I don't want to, I don't want to say it. I don't actually remember it right now, but, uh, but uh, I, I'm hoping uh, I have music. Why I even brought music. I, I now have a, a music fest and it looks like it's going to be sustainable. It looks like it's hmm. going to keep going. Um, it's getting pretty big. Uh, it's July 4th. I've been doing it for like 10 years unsuccessfully fail after fail i think i finally might hit um so uh now that my music fest is up and running and i don't really even have to pay attention to it anymore and like i've got interns ready to take over it for the next decade i think i'm going to start a comic book fest uh for mm. black people that's not just for kids and not just based on uh, the black panther um phenomenon so yeah. that's probably my next my last my last project because i just got the art gallery <laughs> so yeah, it's probably the last thing I'm going to do is start a, a Black Art Con in Chicago. Nice. Hey, nice. Right. Okay, well, yeah, keep us posted and uh, excited to see where it goes. But uh, yeah, just really appreciate the time, you know, um, uh, enjoy enjoy the weather. And uh, I'll try to get through this crazy heat as, as I'll try to make through it like at this point. And yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, just uh, look forward to just conf- continue to follow your work and uh, yeah, thank and, you and all that stuff. So uh, without further ado, I think we'll call it a wrap. Um, again, awesome. appreciate it and uh, and be on the lookout. Definitely. Thanks so much. See you guys soon. And there we have it. That is another episode of the Black Superheroes Matter podcast in the wraps. Again, the purpose of this podcast is for people to get exposed to a variety of different things that black people are creating in the arts and entertainment industry. The goal is for this podcast to bring light to all those and those creators, because as a community, we have the opportunity to skirt some of the problems that we've seen in this day and age when it comes to expressing blackness. And so if you love this, definitely check out the more work that we're doing. Go to at Black Superheroes Matter, or you can go to BlackSuperheroesMatter.com to check out the blog and the write-ups that we do on these guests. And if you're so inclined, feel free to support my work at Iltopia, where we have the Black Superheroes Matter art book, the Black Superheroes Matter sticker packs, and even coloring books, activity guides. And so if you want to check that stuff out, check it out at shop.iltopia.com. It's all black owned. I might add, they're all handmade products and they're all made with love for the community that has really given me the opportunity to find my place in this world. 
And so, again, thank you for another wonderful episode. Thank you for listening. Feel free to follow all the stuff that Black Superheroes Matter is cranking out. And excited to share another wonderful guest with you on next episode. So without further ado, thank you very much.